Good evening. It's really a pleasure to welcome you to what is now our 17th uh, uh, event in our series of conversations. I'm Dietrich Nonnen. I'm the director of the John Nicholas Brown Center. And, and as you know, this series has two goals. Mostly, uh, it is to bring artists, writers, thinkers, musicians uh, together with different publics from outside of Brown and to exchange ideas and to have a a uh, convivial conversation and a little Q&A and uh, of course we're also eager to make this house more visible and more uh, accessible to uh, the citizens of Providence and of course also our faculty and our students and uh, our speaker tonight, Philip, right here next to me uh, is uh, one of uh, the least local of our speakers, <laughs> most of them are local and he's temporarily local because he's a visiting professor in the John Nicholas Brown Center right now and teaching a class for undergraduate students and uh, my office is right across from the seminar room and I'm always so delighted to see the students come into this house and many of them have never been here either and look at this and say, oh, this is amazing and I'm so glad to get to see it and, and they hang out afterwards and, and sit in the rooms of the Brown family and look on their papers <laughs> and so on, it's really wonderful and Philip is the reason that they're here so this is really uh, great. Uh, his class uh, is actually called um, Making the Invisible Visible. It's about urban typologies all over the world, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa and Eastern Europe. And so we're really happy that he's here. And also uh, his wife, uh, Natasha, there in the last row, who is uh, also uh, an architect just like him and teaching at the Paris University in, in Weimar. Uh, and they're both here for a while, which is really absolutely wonderful. So um, Philip has one of the most unusual CVs I've ever seen. Um, and I've told him more than once, I think, that I have no idea how he does everything that he does. Uh, he went to architecture school in Berlin and then started teaching there as well, and did postgraduate work in history and theory in Zurich at the ETH, the um, state-run school, it was a very, very good school, and then went back to Berlin to get his PhD in architecture history, uh, exploring prefabrication in the Soviet Union, and we'll get a little taste of that in the lecture today. Um, and then he founded with his wife Natasha an architecture firm, Euser Architekten, and has built lots of embassies in very unusual places, mostly German, but also French embassies in Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Yemen, Libya, New Delhi, Kazakhstan, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a flourishing architectural uh, practice. He has taught in many, at many universities from St. Petersburg to Berlin, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Ukraine and Moscow. Uh, and uh, apparently all of that was not enough for him, so he founded a publishing company, uh, Dome Publishers, in 2005, which has become the leading publisher in Germany for books on architecture and urban planning. Mm -hmm. uh, they publish about 30 to 40 books every year, many in English, but also in Russian and other languages, um, and so the, the list right now has about 600 titles on it. Amazing, and one of my favorites, which Philip kindly sent me, Actually, was sent directly from China from the printing uh, shop. Is this it's really a first ever and a monumental accomplishment? Seven volumes about sub Saharan Africa uh, and its architecture. It's a fantastic uh, accomplishment, obviously. Many authors and beautifully illustrated. Uh, as you can see here, it's, uh, again about this topic of making the invisible visible. You know, for the first time, we have access to these incredible buildings in this book. And many of the photos, I should say, were also taken by Philip and his drone, the newest thing, he photographs with the drone from above, and so, uh, anyway, it's, it's immensely impressive and uh, really groundbreaking work and wonderful, and uh, as you saw, superbly produced in, in manner of language, in many languages. He yeah, won so many awards, it's a whole separate section of the CV that I can only name a few. He won the German Publishers Prize in 2020, he was awarded the Federal Cross of Merit for cultural and scientific exchanges with the states of the former Soviet Union, awarded by the German president in Berlin. Uh, he won the Golden Lion at the Venice Architecture Biennale, uh, the Historical Book of the Year Award, etc., etc. So it's a long list, but instead of me going on, I, I'm just asking you to help me welcome Philip Moyer. Thank you, Dietrich. Yeah, Dietrich, uh, thank you very much for all these flowers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome from my side. I'm very proud and delighted to, to talk to you and to introduce a subject which is part of my heart, has become part of my heart. It's about uh, former Soviet Union, 
a subject with, uh, which is quite, uh, we, we switch on the news and we hear something about Russia and, and Ukraine and the conflict. Uh, so we know much about the war and the, the conflicts, but uh, we don't know so much about the cultural background of this whole, a third of the hemisphere, former Soviet Union. And I'm going to introduce a subject which I hope it is new for you, but you will find many similarities also to American arts history. Let me introduce you the Jarsky brothers. The Jarsky brothers with a subtitle, Making Soviet Tashkent the Place with the Most Beautiful Panel Buildings Worldwide. <laughs> so what does it stand for? This is the hero for tonight, Nikolai Jarsky. I was delighted to meet him in person. He died a couple of years ago, in fact, 2015. And he, together with his brothers, Alexander Zharsky and Piotr Zharsky were, I would say, the most influential architects of Soviet Tashkent. Why? They all came from Russia in the late 60s and they came to Tashkent. And before I tell you something about their history, their story, I have to take you to Tashkent. So Tashkent is the capital of the former Soviet Republic of Uzbekistan, today independent Uzbekistan. And Tashkent is a city which is more than 2,000 years old, an Islamic city. And you see that on the, on the left-hand side, a very oriental city with all these dead-end small uh, pathways and, and streets. And the Russian ca Russians came in the late 19th century and just added another city. You see that to the right, more Europeanized, the European new town and the oriental old town. So this is important to understand what happened with Tashkent during all the years because there were two, a bipolar city. So oriental city in the east, uh, in, in the west, the Russian or let's say European new city to the east. And during all the years, you see that 1910, 1950, 1970, the Russian part, the European part, was somehow climbing or walking into, into the western part and nearly destroying the oriental part. This is how it looked like in the 1940s, 1943, like Haussmann did it in Paris to just modernize the old city center of Paris by creating and constructing new boulevards through this old city center. The same was done in Tashkent. So this destruction by planning, this is a, a very important term. This is how it looked like. So we had a clash of cultures, a clash of culture of the European culture, the European Russian culture, plus this Uzbek local oriental culture, low, no low rise housing, adobe and, 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 and brick buildings, and then this administration building, what we see here. So different scales came together. And I'm just jumping into 1966. 1966 is a very important year because in the, in the, early, in, in the early months of 1966, a new master plan, a general plan was, plan, well, was done, was, was uh, decided by the, by the Politburo, by the, by the party. And you can see that if you look to the details, you see still this old oriental structure plus this new white boulevards planned by the Russians or by the Soviet planners, by the Soviet architects and urban planners, which would have been destroyed the whole city center, this oriental city. And this is the, just, to, just to get an impression of the scale. So you see the stadium over here and you see all these neighborhood of the stadium. You see the stadium again, and you see what happened with all the city. Panel buildings standing in a very abstract pattern, were, and in parallel, a destruction of the whole oriental city center. So there was no destruction by the planners, but it was destruction by an earthquake. In May, just a couple of weeks after 
the Politburo and, and the city of Tashkent had decided about this new master plan, an earthquake destroyed most of the city center just by, by accident. <laughs> and you see this, the, the unique point for this or parameter of this earthquake was that the, 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 the center of this earthquake was just in the center of the, of the, of the city center. So this is quite seldom. Uh, so it was just in, in, in the center of the city. The city was, I'm not saying destroyed, but demolished. So this is how most of the parts in, in Tashkent looked like in 1966. Demolished, but not destroyed. But it was a good, let's say, a good opportunity for the urban planners just to erase what has been left and just to have a new city. And we have just to... Uh, just to, to, um, to remind ourselves, Tashkent, one of the biggest city in the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union, a city, or let's say a whole country, the biggest country in the world that time, which was completely influenced by political propaganda. The communists had the power. So what happened? So with the, with under the slogan, this, this, uh, the, the so-called Losung, the slogan, uh, People's Friendship, Planners and architects from all over the Soviet Union were invited or more or less forced to go to Tashkent and to reconstruct the city. So whenever the Russians speak about reconstruction, we would think we just reconstruct something which has been destroyed. But reconstruction in the, in the, in the Russian understanding is just modernization by just erasing and constructing or doing something completely new. I'm telling that. So the whole, whole Tashkent was a huge, was, was a huge um, construction site and the city was reconstructed with panel buildings, with prefabricated panel buildings and the knowledge from the whole, from whole Soviet Union, from each different republic uh, was brought to Tashkent. And you see this, this billboard over there, so it, it, it says Ukra Ukraine um, brings new, uh, I'm just uh, interpretation, I Ukraine brings new buildings to Tashkent, new residential buildings from, from Ukraine to Tashkent. Mm. Beautiful pictures were, were taken that time, um, uh, a brigade of, of women workers, female workers, uh, and, uh, doing the, pa the final paintings of all these buildings. Um, and, and the man, uh, which is just, 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 just written over there, from Kharkov in, in, in the eastern part of, of Ukraine, always in the news uh, nowadays, uh, from Tashkent to Tash uh, from, from Kharkov to Tashkent, uh, the workers on the left hand side, on, on the right hand side, you might remember the guy on the right hand side, Nikolai Zharsky, together with his brothers, Alexander to the right, Pyotr in the center. So they also came to, to Tashkent in the late 60s to reconstruct the city. They were all trained and graduated artists and Nikolai and, and Alexander were also architects. They came, to, uh, they came to Tashkent and they very soon they started to decorate the residential buildings. So what we can see here is the first example of a mosaic, which was, you can see that, so the panel and the mosaic was integrated. So it was, was one part. It was not only this gray concrete panel, so they started to do some decoration for the panels. And what Nikolai Jarsky told me personally was that in the, in the beginning, it was just an idea because they thought about, okay, so we are artists, what, how can we contribute to the new city of Tashkent? And they thought, okay, let's do some mosaics. Let's talk to the party leaders, they approved. Let's talk to the chief architect, he approved. And then this was the first facade which was decorated by them. I'm showing that, not only because it was the first, but it, it, we, we can see the full range of what was the program, so the, art, the artist's program. So we can, we can find some more abstract patterns, we can find some floral, natural patterns, but we can also see some political propaganda. You need to know that Uzbekistan is one of the biggest producers of cotton, cotton and textiles. And you can see that also, in this case, the women are working with, with woven textiles. 
So this is so the whole program of propaganda, which was implemented in these facades, you can see already in this first facade, in the end, the Jarsky brothers decorated more than 200 facades of residential buildings in whole Tashkent. And I just take you by your hand and I just show you some, some examples. Beautiful paintings, drawings, sketches. So everything was done by, from an artist's perspective. So we would, that's sometimes for, for, for most of, 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 of people, it's, it's something new, it's surprising that when we think about the prefabrication, prefabricated panel builds, mass housing in Soviet Union, we would always think about gray, monotonous, repeating each other, nothing special. But whenever, like always, whenever you go into the detail, you will find a variety, a beauty of architecture, and in this case also a beauty of artists, of art. And I have to add, the art is not only the mosaics as part of the architecture, the art is always also these artworks of drawings. It's like a kind of tattoo. So, so this is one of the residential buildings which is completely covered with these mosaics. And if you see that building, I was very much reminded to what we know from the American con continent. So the, uh, the library of the university in, in, in Mexico, 1956. And we can get an imagination where the Jaskis brought this idea of course, there was an exchange of ideas also in the 50s. Even there was the Western Communist part and there was uh, the, 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 the capitalist and the Eastern uh, Communist um, bloc. But the exchange was, there was an exchange, an exchange of ideas. I'm not saying that the, 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 the Jaskis were only influenced by, by the Mexican architecture, by the Mexican art, but it, was, it became very popular in whole Soviet Union to decorate buildings with these nice, colorful and programmatic mosaics. But what was very special to Uzbekistan, to Tashkent was that it was done and created for the residential buildings, not for also, but not only for the public buildings. I just take you to two examples of I would say the most beautiful ones. This is an ensemble in the city of Tashkent, still existing today, which was built for the workers of the airplane um, factory, which existed in Tashkent. And you can see that in the center, we have a cosmonaut standing or representing the, the space. We have the, um, I would say, it's, 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 it's uh, an aircraft from, from, the, from the Red Army showing the power, the power of military. And I want to tell you, uh, I want to present you what, what, is, what is behind all these ideas. So it was not only political propaganda, but it was really art. And when we see this, Sketch on the right hand side, this cosmonaut float, floating in front of the zodiac. Of course, we see all the, we see the Sputnik as, as, as the icon of the icon of the, of the Soviet power in space. We see other spacecrafts, the spacecraft which was sent to, 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 to the uh, planet Venus. And again, motifs, this floral motifs, what we saw already in the first in the first um, mosaic, they became a little bit a signature of the, of the Jarsky brothers. They, you see them in many places. Why I, why I show you this? Because it reminded me to what we know from Leonardo da Vinci, the man, the man within the circle, the man within in the square, not floating, but it is, I would say, I mean, if we talk about art history, we always have to compare um, history and contemporary art, and then we see some similarities and some differences. But I would say, here we can say the man, the cosmonaut in the center of the world, in the center of the space. And this is how the artwork was developed. So we have the sketch on the right-hand side, 
we have the watercolor on the right hand side and we have the original. So this is how it was implemented. And what is important to mention is you see always positive negative. Mm -hmm. This has something to do with the production process. I'm going to introduce you a little bit later. And I just have to tell you one anecdote. As you can see from my dark hair, it was a couple of years ago when I met uh, Nikolai Zharsky. It should be around t uh, 10 years or so. He gave me as a present a very, very small watercolor. It was with, with very nice and colorful, bright dots. He gave it to me and I was reminded, my God, I saw this somewhere. You could imagine that it is, I tell you, it is part of this is an ensemble of three residential buildings. But I was a little bit surprised because something was wrong. I went there again and I saw this. So what happened here? I just go back. You see that in the production process, obviously, one panel was wrong because when they did all these mosaics, I'll show you later how to do it, when they did it in the in a vice versa way, they did it completely wrong. <laughs> Obviously, no one ever saw that because I was talking to, to Jarski and I reminded him so what happened there. And he was just with his eyes saying, he knew about, but obviously the others didn't know or didn't re they didn't recognize because they thought it should be an artwork like this. <laughs> so it was uh, quite, 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 quite funny that time. Um, but um, this tells me that even we had these, let's say, dictatorship and this um, autocratic uh, system of the, of the Soviet Union. Um, so it was part of the political program to, 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 do, or to, to, to do all these, or to produce all these residential buildings. But when it comes to the implementation, we are all humans and also we do some mistakes. But what's the problem? In the end, Dietrich mentioned that, uh, I, I published my, I, I finished my, my PhD. Um, it was very soon, it was translated also into Russian language. And for the Russian language, I, I put uh, this, I, I selected this, um, this uh, um, uh, facade um, presented, or let's say developed, de designed by Alexander Zharsky, not by Nikolai, by Alexander Zharsky. And shortly after this book was published in Russia, I was contacted by the late widow of Alexander Zharsky. He had a second family. The widow was, she's around 60 years old now. And um, she invited me to go to Izhevsk. Izhevsk is a, ci is a city where the three Zharsky brothers came from. It's just in the center of Russia, just in the middle of nowhere. We all know Kalashnikov. The Kalashnikov factory is placed or located in Izhevsk. So that is what we what we remind us what reminds us with Izhevsk. But since then, I am also reminded with the Zharsky brothers because they all came from Izhevsk. I was invited to go to to Izhevsk. I met on the left hand side the the, the late daughter of of Alexander Zharsky, and they presented me some originals which Alexander produced after he returned back to Russia, and you see this these colorful drawings which are which give some some um, not only the beauty but happiness it's everything but boring everything but but this gray color what we have in mind when we talk about or when we think about um, Soviet um, mass housing and, ma uh, and prefabricated housing and they were so enthusiastic the whole family was so in also so enthusiastic you see again all these floral or ornaments um, what, what, what Alexander Zharsky produced, the family keeps that as a heritage and they are very proud about. And I want to tell you how, how they did it because that's, that's quite interesting because all these mosaics were individual. So the panels and the series, the housing series, they were produced in a factory, but how came these nice ornaments and these nice mosaics into these, into these uh, production process? And the Zharsky brothers, they in, the, in the early 70s, they were quite popular 
and of course quite famous in, 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 in the Soviet, um, in the Uzbek Soviet um, uh, Socialist Republic. Uh, so they were, they were not saying superstars, by, but, but some, uh, some, some articles were, were, uh, were published about their work. And you see that the three brothers working, of course it's a kind of propaganda, but working on a nice drawing. They produced the drawing in the scale one by one. Just imagine one by one for a mosaic, which is sometimes nine stories high. Mm. Of course, they produced different parts, but in fact, it was more than 25 meters. After they produced this one by one scale drawing, it was placed on the ground and so-called mosaic makers which were all female, by the way. So they put, the, they put these tiles. It was broken tiles. It's not, sometimes it is glass music, but mainly it was, it was broken tiles. So they put on the ground and glued them with a the paper. So just to take them as a part and to put into these big molds for the concrete panels. When it comes to the detail, it's very, it's very banal. It's, it's, it's just a tile, it's a very small tiles, one and a half by one and a half inch. Very, very small. They broke it by hand, and then they made these very nice mosaics. They were put into these metal molds, concrete, um, a frame of uh, 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 some, some bars, some metal bars, just to, to for, for this reinforced concrete. This was how they how it was produced, and then in the end, the result were these kind of facade panels, just to get a scale. Two point seventy to three meters, which is nine to ten feet high, and up to five tons by the weight. Just imagine. So it's, 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 it's not something you do, you do in your back garden, in, in your garden. It's really heavy industry and the production the process and the whole factories, it was heavy industry. <coughs> Huge production halls, factories, cranes, um, trucks. So it was amazing. And during this, in this whole process, it's just unbelievable how they managed to decorate more than 200 facades. So in, in, the, in the late 80s, they also produced some ornaments, not, not by, by, um, by, um, by, by mosaics, but just reliefs. Reliefs were also part of the work of the Jarskis. And I'm just coming to, the clo to close uh, my, my short presentation. So they did not only work in Tashkent, we can also find some of the works in Tbilisi, Georgia, Nitrino, which is uh, the Russian Caucasus, northern part of Caucasus. Just imagine, just in the, in the middle of this beautiful landscape, you have the residential buildings, but decorated by Jarskis. And coming back to Tashkent, this is what I'm currently working on, on a book only on the Jarsky brothers, and like a puzzle, to bring together the drawings, what I found in the archive, and to bring them together with the real buildings in Tashkent and elsewhere. To make it a little bit more academic in the end, just let me uh, also recall the, uh, uh, let's say, three messages. Um, what is important to say if, if we talk about uh, Tashkent. Tashkent has always been an architectural laboratory in the, on, the, on the Silk Road, so it was the Russians starting in the, in the late 19th century, but till the late era of the Soviet Union, it was always, they were doing experiments in Tashkent. And the, recon the reconstruction program after the earthquake of 1966 allowed for, for a comprehensive demolition of the oriental old city. So it was not a destruction, not destruction and reconstruction due to the earthquake, but also due to this general plan. And nowhere else in the former Soviet Union you will find more elaborately decorated apartment buildings in prefabricated housing series. So this, is th this was one of the 
three, th three sentences out of the three results of my, of my, um, of my research. The Zhasky brothers making Soviet Tashkent the place with the most beautiful panel buildings worldwide. Whenever you have a chance to go there, you might be surprised. You won't meet uh, Nikolai Zhasky, but uh, he had this nice drawing and reminding to the 20 26th of April 1966, the, the day when the earthquake demolished most of the parts of the city of Tashkent. Thank you very much. I have a question. Um, most of the discussion here, was, it, it seems, was about Tashkent and the Tashkent brothers, if I'm saying it correctly. But I was curious, one of the books I noticed that uh, I guess you have published is about the uh, Russian mass housing, mm -hmm. and I was curious about whether that's included in this. Is it different, uh, and in what ways is the style different? And also, is the ownership of these buildings that all of this artwork was on are those uh, state owned or individual owned, and how did that impact? Because you said they were quite popular, but still, there's a cost to doing to implementing their ideas and with the weight and the, and the yeah. time and materials. Uh, I, w I wish you would address that. Uh, 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 um, during my, my, my research, it was a surprise for me that even in Soviet Union, when we only had the state as a client, there were different kinds of clients. So we had the party as a client. We had the city of, in this case, Tashkent. But we also had factories as clients for architects. I just showed you the, uh, the, the example of the residential buildings with all these aeronautics and aircraft uh, facades, which was ordered by the factory for the aircrafts. So this, that had, impl that had influ influence on the kind of the decoration. So if there was a, if there was a, a, a client just to say, uh, okay, I, I need a new housing for 200 families and I don't have money or don't have funds to resources to also pay for these for this nice mosaic, they just they, they just they just ordered a, a, a let's say call it a, a boring housing series without any decoration. But once there was another client to say with more responsibility for 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 building culture and architecture, they ordered some mosaics as well. And the um, political program or let's say the program for the artworks was also influenced by the Zhasky brothers themselves. So it was, we don't need to think that it was only the party to order special motifs, but it was mainly the authors, the artists, to suggest something and to get it improved. Of course, in the late 70s, just uh, before the 1980s um, um, Olympics in Moscow, we can find some motifs where we find the Olympic rings as part of the housing decoration. But it's also interesting to see that after Glasnost and Perestroika in the late 80s, we don't find any propaganda motifs. We only find abstract motifs and floral natural patterns, but no figurative um, images anymore. Got that page? Okay. So I had two, two things I was wondering about. How, uh, when did these kinds of uh, decorative buildings stop being built? And then who is maintaining them? I'm wondering, are they being maintained? So the um, the decoration, what the, the examples of the decoration, what I showed you, they started in the late 60s. So the Zhasky brothers, they, they did not come 1966. They, they arrived to Tashkent between 1968 and 1969. So the first example, what I was showing, it was around 1970. Since then, it has not been maintained. So this is, this is the big disadvantage of, this, of these structures, of these uh, mass housing uh, examples, what we know from the Soviet Union. It was just built and it was just left over. So there was no budget for the maintaining, only the maintaining by the people who lived in. 
And we have just, just for our understanding, when it was built in 1970, so the destruction of, of, of Soviet Union happened in 20 years later, 1990, 1991. And now we have another 30 years. So they are longer in the post-Soviet era than they were ever existing in the Soviet era. When I was starting the research on that, I was completely alone. So I, was, uh, so, so I went somewhere to, to some archives. They were not even interested of what I was doing. I was collecting drawings. I, I was presented some drawings from, the Rasky, from, from Nikolai Rasky him, himself. Um, uh, ten years ago, I was contacted by an authority from Uzbekistan, and they wrote a very angry letter that they heard that I have something in my archive which I should give back because it's had some, some kind of stolen culture. <coughs> just, just imagine what happened during these t yeah. 10 years. So they, and I can say that today they understand that this is a cultural heritage. I don't know if I was, particip if, if I was contributing to that understanding, but obviously this is what I, what I heard from some friends and, and colleagues in Tashkent. Of course, the officials in Tashkent today, they recognize if there is an international publication on the city of Tashkent. And if it is about the Soviet housing heritage, they are more curious who's, who's doing that and what is the, the background. And, and so I'm, I would say today, there is an understanding that this is part of the heritage of the Soviet Union, but I can't say that there is a maintaining. I could, I, could, I could give you another lecture presenting and showcasing some examples where in the most beautiful panels someone did a hole just to install his a a AC uh, chiller. Uh, funny to see, but on the other hand, sad, on sad to see that there was a destruction of, of, this, of this artwork. But this is, this is how history is it's continuing and we w and, and also this evening is a possibility just to get familiar to, to to let you know about that there is this kind of heritage if you if you just google and ask uzbekistan and tourism tourism sites you get directed to khiva bukhara samarkand all these nice uh, um, names of, of cities what we what we know from one and uh, one thousand and one nights, <laughs> and, uh, and so, so we have to we, we we are reminded with all this heritage, uh, uh, fifteen hundred or even two thousand years ago. But I would say um, we also have to think about that even contemporary architecture or, co or architecture from the twentieth century is also part of the history, and we also have to to value this uh, this history as well. Yeah, question. Yes, go for it. Um, two things. Um, in my experience, panel architecture is always very difficult because of the junctions mm -hmm. and all the um, synthetic materials that have to go keep the concrete from mm -hmm. and concrete moves mm -hmm. and all this sort of thing. Um, all of these are mosaic, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. The only other place I can remember seeing anything would be in, um, in Gaudi's architecture in Spain, mm -hmm. where he, I mean, that's even, well, I didn't think there were ever any drawings. <laughs> they were just kind of the bits and pieces were stuck into the uh, concrete as it was cured. So Gaudi, uh, I mean, it was never finished in the end, <laughs> but, 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 but it was this, this mosaic, yeah. this mosaic was done on site. Yeah. So the mosaics, what I showed you, they were prefabricated. So they were produced in a factory, and they were, they are a part of the panel, yeah. and that that makes it so specific. We can find different examples of of of, of mosaics in in Tashkent as well. So we find examples of the the Zhasky brothers connected, a real connection between the uh, between the tile or the mosaic and the concrete panel. But we, we can also find other, other examples where the mosaic was just produced after 
the building was finished and it was just hanged like a, like a, like a painting, yeah. fixed with a facade, yeah. but it came later. And, and I imagine the weathering, because I'm assuming it gets cold. Yes, <laughs> and, and uh, I, I mean... You know, that, that, that must that's a hell of a challenge. But the mosaic helps because if you have all these different small dots, yeah. if one mosaic part is falling out, it, it does not destroy the whole picture. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I also saw some, some examples or some attempts to reconstruct that just by painting. Mm. So it was just added color. Um, but also, I saw also some some added uh, mosaics to the, to these um, to these panels as well. It's, it's fascinating. Some of it. Yeah. Yeah. Quick follow up question. Um, so this is really public art, right? In a, in a essential sense, just like our murals downtown Providence mm -hmm. uh, fits into that pattern. And um, sort of a twofold question. It sounded like it was really quite unique, and I spend a lot of time in East Germany where they have exactly the same housing blocks because it was part of the Russian mm -hmm. sphere of influence, of course. And so you find them in Poland and mm -hmm. you know, many other countries. And it was quite unique, right, that this sort of ornament happened. Yeah. Is there a, would you say, is there a reason that Tashkent had a particular pictorial tradition that that, that state and that uh, location went for it? And the second follow-up question is, were they the only ones doing that, or were there other artists as well who followed suit? And, and we suit? have to, to remind ourselves that Uzbekistan is, was one of the southern republics in Soviet Union, very much influenced by Persian architecture. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, they have some examples, especially in, in Khiva, Bukhara, and Samarkand, with all these ancient, uh, ancient mosaics. Not ancient, but uh, mosaics which are 600, 700 years old. Um, so it, so the, let's say the, the media mosaic was not new to the to the region. It was new to other regions in Soviet Union, like Siberia, in the northern part of the northern European part, where we can also find these examples. They were influenced then from the southern republics, and these ideas moving towards to the north. We can find. The most beautiful, the most beautiful uh, mosaics in former Soviet Union we can find in Ukraine. Ukraine has a long tradition because it was the part of Russia, of Soviet Union, which was mainly or the most um, influenced by Byzantines. So we have Byzantines, we have Persia moving to the north, entering the Soviet Union. So there is, there is this Let's say we have the roots in, in art history and architecture history, um, but then it came together. So we know that from the Islamic art, Islamic art is always a pattern and repeating and mirroring a pattern. And this was combined with all these panel buildings producing one panel and copying and producing many of them. So this was also a coincidence this might have influenced uh, the engineers to allow the Jarskis uh, to do this kind of, of mosaics. And uh, your, your second question, so the variety and the quantity of fa facades for residential buildings, we can only find in Tashkent. We, we do find other examples in, other, in all other former socialist republics, also in Eastern Europe, not only so former Soviet Union. But the quantities are not the same as what we find in, in Tashkent. Well, on, on that note, my, it's always my pleasant task to invite you to the uh, room next door to continue the conversation in, a, in smaller circles around Philip. But this was really terrific. I hope I'm Thank, you. Thanks for your interest. Thank you.